So Ryan, in addition to opening the windows, when you, we started this conversation, you gave us a long list of possible places we could find toxins in our home. And I know that can be overwhelming um, for some. And if you're not ready to invest or don't have the financial ability to invest in a full testing of everything in your home, what are some concrete, smaller ways that we can start to reduce toxins in our home uh, right away today? You know, in your experience, what are sort of the top three things that you have found um, amongst your homes that you've inspected that have been, you know, the triggers for most people's bodies? I, I wouldn't put on a whole bunch of nasty perfume or cologne and go and even though sometimes people are still doing that, you know, I wouldn't pee on your toilet seat. I mean, there's just these obvious <laughs> things. But yeah, um, my, my twelve-year-old son would definitely pee on your toilet seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to The Well Drop, your go-to source for actionable wellness tips. We're your hosts, Amber Berger and Dina Wismer. And today we're delving into home base, how to keep our home safe for our health and free of toxins. Environmental toxins and stressors, they're everywhere. In some cases, they impact our health and it's widely... Sorry, I'm going to start over. Environmental toxins and stressors are everywhere. In some cases, their impact on our health is well understood, and in others, like EMFs, we're still learning. I often worry about the side effects not only for myself, but for my family, and it's reassuring to know that there are steps you can take to protect yourself at home. With us today is Ryan Blazer, an expert in all things related to toxins in our homes. He's a building biologist from Test My Home. His job is to test for indoor pollutants and provide concrete solutions for families on how to minimize these pollutants. Ryan once told me that although it is a lot of work to think about this and to clean out our homes, it's even more work if you get sick. Um, so it is well worth the time and effort. So we are so excited to have him on to help us do just that. So whatever kind of building you live in, Join us as we learn how to protect our family from toxins that seep into our homes. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me on. So what is a building biologist? So a building biologist is somebody who studies the environment of our homes and our work and <laughs> even our vehicles. We spend 90% of our lives indoors. And I like to think of this the indoor environment of kind of like our second skin, right? We have our skin of our body and that holds in our cells and our microbiome and our blood and everything. But then we have our home and the walls and that's almost like our second skin. And the things that are inside that environment, building biology studies that and how it affects the body either positively or negatively. Amazing. And what, so there's a lot of things that are in our home that could be considered pollutants or toxins. Uh, what are the categories of, of things that you look for when you go into a home? Yeah, the main categories we look at are mold, air quality, chemical exposure, water that we drink and bathe and shower in, the lighting and the EMF or the electronics that are around us. Those are really the six main things. There's a seventh one, sound and vibration. It can affect people. It's not as common. Uh, but those are really the main things that we look at. Maybe living in a city, though, sound and vibration is very uh, appropriate. Sure, yeah, or by an airport or a freeway or a train that comes by every couple hours. But in those cases, that can be a big stressor. I love that you guys actually dive into all these yeah. pillars. I'm super passionate about wellness, especially I believe that the wellness yeah. begins at home and considering that we spend so much time indoors. I don't know, I'm waiting for hopefully a study to come out, to compare a pre-COVID versus a post-COVID world, I believe in a post-COVID world that we're spending even more time indoors um, because of the work from home movements. You know, people aren't leaving the house to even go in that commuting process to get from one place to another. They're just starting their day at home. If you're working from home, you're not even stepping outside until maybe the end of the day at best. So there might even be days people don't even leave their house, which is pretty wild. So you know, if you're in that environment all day long, if that environment is not optimized and it has toxins that you're breathing and living and breathing in, that's going to affect your body. Like just thinking about it from a realist, right? Like that just, it has to. And I think most people don't realize, like I want to kind of dive into like, why 
we should care about the quality of inside our house. Why does that matter? Why should we care? The reason that we should care is because the things that are in that environment directly affect the body. If we have toxins and chemicals that are off-gassing in our air, or mold spores or bacteria, all of these things can get inside the body and wreak a bunch of havoc, cause oxidative stress, cause sickness, cause illness. And so the question that I guess people need to ask is, does our environment around us affect the body? And the answer to that question is yes, a lot. And I think people really underestimate how much it truly does affect us. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that if somebody's having, I find a lot of people end up testing the inside of their house as sort of a last result, not as an initial when someone's not feeling well, because I think mold is sort of this hidden thing that really can affect your body. And it's hard to really know that that's what it is. Um, but if you actually kind of reverse the thought process and test it inside your home first, you might uncover the answer faster. Or it's an easy thing to just sort of rule out, okay, where am I spending most of my time at home? How does my home check out? If it checks out clean, okay, done. Let's move on to the next. Right, exactly. It's all the upstream effects. You know, when we talk about health, we're all shifting to more of a way of holistically looking at our health, saying, what is the root cause of when I get a headache, we, instead of reaching for the Tylenol, we want to ask ourselves, what's causing the headache? What's making this headache happen in the first place? That's a symptom that the body's trying to say there's something wrong. And when we choose pills or medication, a lot of times we're just smashing out the check engine light, so to speak, and, and not listening to our body tell us there's something wrong. And a lot of these things that are affecting the body do come from the environment around us and not just the environmental stresses, but the um, mental stress as well. There's a lot of stress around us outside that we don't give enough credit to. And we need to be aware of that so that we can minimize it because it does affect the direct body. To me, to me, that begs the question of, and again, we want, it's a best practice to do this before you're having any symptoms, of course, and that's the dream. But if you haven't done it, what are some things that might be alarm signals that you should be doing it. You mentioned headache, um, and I'm sure there's a wide range. Can you give us some examples of things that might be, say, oh, I really should be testing my home? You know, a really big red flag right off the bat is if you go on vacation or you leave for an extended period of time and you feel a lot better. Um, it's not just because you're hanging out on the beach. There is some of that to that for sure. But if you have a stuffy nose, a, a little headache or brain fog, and then you leave and you go stay somewhere else and that goes away, and then you go back to your house and the symptoms come back, that's absolutely a big red flag. So be conscious of that when you change your environment. Maybe you're eating the same, around the same people, but the only thing that changed is the environment. That's a huge red flag. But also just looking at your overall health. Maybe you're eating right, you're exercising, you're taking your supplements, your blood work looks good, but you're just not feeling well. You just don't feel like you're as sharp as you used to be. You're getting tired at the end of the day or maybe you're seeing rashes or respiratory things, all of these are, are signs. And so just really getting in tune with your body and listening to your body and saying, what is my body telling me right now? What's going on? And then lean into that and really look into what's causing that. I like that. I think so many of us are disconnected to our body these days that almost we need to just take a moment to just sit and start to just feel ourselves again, right? And not just keep like going. I feel like we're all like just like these freight trains, just like on like... <laughs> fast forward and we're just like on the road to nowhere, but we just need to slow down and take a second and just say like, how am I feeling today? Like, how did I wake up this morning and take that moment? It literally could be one second. Like it doesn't mean it needs to take a lot of time, but even take one second to just do a little self check-in to say, do I feel well rested? Do I feel energized today? Do I feel happy? Do I feel mm -hmm. like a little moody or just something? I think that just having that check in with self, you know, we sort of need to kind of, kind of promote that, I suppose, because we're not really taught that it's not something that we're taught in school. It's not something you have to sort of as parents, I always say to lead by example. And I like to do that with my kids and they love to make fun of me, but it's totally fine. I'll totally take them making fun of me because I know in time they'll end up doing that themselves when they're on their own. Um, and if you actually take that moment to check in with yourself, you might be able to uncover something that's off sooner than waiting until the alarm bells are going off. And then you're sort of like solving for the emergency case, which I think everyone's probably good. You know, if there's a fire, it's like stop, drop and roll, everything stops. And then you're solving for the emergency case. But we sort of want to 
be preventative and avoid getting to that level, right? Like there's so many factors within the home. You mentioned, you know, mold, air, light, EMFs. You know, in your experience, what are sort of the top three things that you have found um, amongst your homes that you've inspected that have been, you know, the triggers for most people's bodies? Yeah. And before I answer that, though, I just want to kind of expand on what you're saying. So that really kind of hit. I really like what you're saying about, you know, the, the body, mind, spiritual connection is something that I feel like a lot of people have lost. And just to take that moment, you know, even... I've, I've been trying to do this more is meditate because my mind as an entrepreneur, I'm always thinking, what can I do? What can, if I'm just sitting there, I feel like I'm wasting time, but it's so important <laughs> that it's not a waste of time to sit and check in with yourself. Five minutes, 10 minutes, just sit in the morning or at night, take some time and do that is such a big health hack that so many people are not doing. So I thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. That's a, a good point. I know it's a little off topic, but that's so important. Um, three main things that I'm seeing in people's home that are the biggest things are mold, for sure, too much electronic exposure, and not enough fresh air in their house. Those three things are, I'm seeing them almost in every home, um, at least at some level or another. I think the fresh air is a good one. I mean, I, I was going to say, I just read an article, actually, interestingly, that in Austria, many landlords require it in a lease to open windows every day and let in wow. fresh air, uh, which I thought was super interesting um, because we would never, here in the United States, we would never think to put that in a contract, um, but that it actually is considered fundamental to the health of people and the building itself. Uh, to let fresh air in for a certain amount of time, no matter how cold, no matter what the weather. Um, and it's interesting that you say that because now I've been, since reading that article, opening the windows and I live in New York City and, you know, there's lots of noise. So I, we don't always open the windows, but I find that it really does. It, apparently it also is great for sleep and to have that fresh air in the apartment um, is beneficial for all kinds of reasons. So it's it's interesting that you say that. Um, yeah. Of all of the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I have a, a meter that I keep here right on my desk and it measures the CO2 level. And what that does indicates how much fresh air I'm getting in the room. And you want to be less than 800. When you get to 1500, your brain cognition has decreased by 50% just because you're getting a lot less oxygen. It's like being at high altitude. Also at, fit, at 1500, you're breathing in six percent of the air you're breathing in there's other people's breaths that have already breathed out so if you're in like a, like a school or a big environment you know and this comes back to the whole COVID thing getting fresh air is really one of the biggest things you can do to stop transmission yeah. because we don't want to be breathing in or recycling all the other people's air that's breathing out that's kind of gross if you think about it like that but 1500 we can get to 1500 pretty quick if you're not opening up doors and windows a lot of homes that i test are in the thousand to two thousand range unless they're consciously open the windows in their house. Wow. And how long do you need to keep these windows open for on a daily basis? Is there a time you know, frame? If, if you get a little cross breeze 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, that's plenty, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, the that's more sweet. you can do, the better. Yeah. But it doesn't take a whole lot, you know. But in the, in the f effort to be energy efficient, the 90s and the 2000s, everyone's building these super airtight homes. And then, of course, when I was raised, I was taught – don't leave the door open. You're going to, you know, you're letting out all the heat or the cold and keep everything closed up. And that's kind of how we were taught and our mentality. But that actually goes against healthy building practices because we want fresh air. We want the CO2 to leave and the fresh oxygen to come in. Super important. So Ryan, in addition to opening the windows, when you, we started this conversation, you gave us a long list of possible places we could find toxins in our home. And I know that can be overwhelming. Um, for some. And if you're not ready to invest or don't have the financial ability to invest in a full testing of everything in your home, what are some concrete, smaller ways that we can start to reduce toxins in our home uh, right away today? Yeah. One of the biggest things you can do that's free and, and you can implement right now is taking off your shoes in the front door, not leaving uh, or not tracking stuff into your house. If you think about all the nasty places we uh, walk when we're out in public, we fill up our car with gas, we get petroleum products and gas on our shoe. And then we go into the public bathroom, and there's high chance of E. coli and then na nasty cleaning products. And then we go to the park and walk around on the grass, pesticides and herbicides and all these things collect on our shoe. And then we walk inside our house, especially if we have carpet, that's like a sponge, it's going to collect all these things over time. So people 
that don't take off their shoes and I test their homes, that's always the toxic load is always so much higher, especially if you have little ones that are crawling around on the floor. That's going to end up in their mouth. It get, gets on their hands. Very, very critical to implement. You know, a lot of Asian countries, they have this practice for years and they look at us like we're disgusting for doing this and they should. It's, it's not a really healthy practice at all. It is true. Until yeah. I moved to New York City growing up, I mean, I don't think I took, I never took my shoes off at the front door, but growing, you know, then living in the city 20 years because the city is so dirty, I started that practice. And when my parents would come over, they really did think that we were crazy. Like when we were say, okay, you're at the door, like pause, take off your shoes, then you can come in. But the more that you know, when you understand, like think about your shoe, where did your shoe go all day? And then you're walking and trudging through your house. And especially you're right. If you have a baby, I think that's where, you know, maybe that awareness starts at first, because like, they're the ones crawling on the floor in their hands and then they're sticking everything in their mouth. I mean, it's pretty gross and probably dangerous from all the chemicals that must be, you know, but especially you're up North and the salt is, you know, if it's winter and salt is being thrown on the sidewalk so that you can walk and it melts it. And then all of a sudden that's on your shoe. And then imagine that's pretty strong for, anyone's body. I, I like, imagine it's the that? same thing with pets, right? If you're walking your dog and then you bring your dog home, um, I mean, we, my, in my house, we wipe the dog's paws. Is that a proper behavior? Is there something better we should be doing? Cause no, it's the same perfect. idea, right? Yeah. Same idea. Yep. Absolutely. Especially, you know, we see it and they say, well, they just run out in the backyard and stuff, but then they spray pesticides and herbicides on their backyard and for pest control. And then they bring all that and track it into the house. So you're kind of defeating the purpose, you know, so it is when you do have pets, you need to be a little bit extra cautious and wipe the feet. Yeah, that's really important. And people say, oh, that's a little extra. That's too much. But you know what? All these little things, they add up. And I, I call it environmental hygiene. I don't think that term's really taken hold yet, but it's like, I wouldn't go smoke a cigarette in your house, you know? I like that. I, I wouldn't put on a whole bunch of nasty perfume or cologne and go and even though sometimes people are still doing that, you know, I wouldn't pee on your toilet seat. I mean, there's just these obvious <laughs> things, but yeah. Uh, my, so my 12 year old son would definitely pee on your toilet seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my, and my uh, 14 year old daughter would probably come over and wear some perfume, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we, we got to teach the best we can, but we just got to be aware and educate and talk about this stuff. If we're not talking about it, no one's going to take it into account. But it is important because these things are toxins. They are stressors. They get into the body. They do affect us. So it is important to think about this stuff. So that, those are two great things, to open the windows and not wear shoes. If you were going to test one area of your home, you mentioned water, you mentioned EMF, you mentioned mold, um, what would, you know, and you, only, and you didn't have the ability to test everything. What would be, and you were having symptoms of some sort, I guess it depends on the symptom or how would you decide what to test for? You know, a lot of this stuff we can do visual wise. We don't necessarily need testing. You know, when I first started doing this, testing was the big thing. But now that I've done thousands of homes by now, we kind of know what to look for. And so one of the things too is going through your whole home and looking at all of your personal care products and your cleaning supplies, your fragrances. And there's a website, EWG. And they have an app where you can scan the barcode and put the products in. It will rate it on a scale from one to 10. How dangerous is this for your home? I would challenge just everyone to get that app and go through their home this next weekend and go through all of their products, all the stuff that's sitting in the shelves you haven't used forever. And if it's three or higher, toss it and go replace it with something that's a lot more natural. I mean, that's really a big one. And that's a good place you can start. As far as mold, that really comes down to good visual. Mold needs water to grow. And so what we're doing when we do a mold inspections, we're looking for the water damage. We're not necessarily looking for mold because that's a lot harder to spot. So we'll lift up the toilet tank and look underneath. Is there mold growing in the toilet tank? That's a natural Petri dish. It's a dark, damp place. We'll look underneath every single one of the sinks. Sometimes we have to pull stuff out. Is there any leaking, any water damage? Is it moist? We're looking around the showers. Is there any cracks? Is there any places where water can get in? Um, in the crawl space, go in the attic walk around the house, look for cracks, look, is there sprinklers that are hitting the house? <clears throat> you know, when it rains a lot, is water pooling up against the house? We want to look for any kind of water intrusion or potential water intrusion. If we see anything like that, then that's the justification to go to the next level and hire a mold inspector to come out and really dial in where it's at. But a lot of it, like we were talking with the body, being aware of the body, be aware of your house as well. You know, 
is the house leaking? Is, you know, what's going on? Is there things that don't look right? Is there staining on the roof, bubbling of the drywall? Things that just don't look right. That's the, the things we want to look into more and see what's causing that. Yeah, it's such actually perfect timing for me. So in my dining room, my wallpaper was starting to discolor and we were wondering, oh, is it the glue, the wallpaper? Like something's kind of funny. And it was a while. And finally, we actually called somebody to come and we like, I got the wallpaper. We're like, all right, we'll just replace the wallpaper. They came, they're like, actually, no, you have a leak from your window. Like, Mm. oh, okay. So then just this week, literally... I had somebody come and so then they checked the windowsill, they re it. I mean, I had no idea that there was a leak. So now I'm thinking, okay, we sealed that up. Should I now test for mold? Probably. Right. And we can talk about this more offline because there's something we need to go through and make sure that's done right. But yeah, in that situation, if water has been in your house or at a leak for more than 48 hours, mold will start to grow because it will take the mold spores, which we have all over in the environment. The mold spores are waiting for water. So as soon as we get water, it's party time. It's like a seed starting to grow, except for it does it a lot faster than a plant. So 48 mm-hmm. hours, it's it's budding, it's starting to grow. Within two weeks, it's full grown colony, it's set up shop, it's got his buddy set up shop and they're producing mycotoxins and they're producing more mold spores. And that's what shoots it off and to reproduce and, and to recolonize. And so if you've had a roof leak or a wall leak or something underneath the sink that's been going on for more than a week or two, yeah. chances are you have mold. Yep. Mine's been going on for a while. And I didn't know it was a leak. <clears throat> I just thought it was something with the wallpaper. Great. Here we go. Yep. It's never a so, dull moment. <laughs> yeah. So what you want to do in that situation is we want to physically remove the actual mold growth. Mm-hmm. Now, Step one is to fix the water leak. That's always step one, because as long as there's water there, it's going to continue to feed. So we want to remove the water. That will kill the mold or put the mold in a dormant state. But now we want to remove it because we don't want it affecting you anymore. So you would actually cut out the drywall in that area. And they say go two feet past the, the known water damage spot just to make sure you've got everything. Now you want to do that under containment. So because what happens, think of that like a a bee's nest or a hornet's nest under there. As soon as you start opening that up and disturbing it, all those little, it's going to spread these mold spores throughout your whole house. And so a professional would come in, they'd set up a little tent around there. They'd have yeah. some HEPA filters running. They'd go in, they'd tear it all out. They'd bag it up. They'd wipe everything, clean everything. And then they'd take that outside really carefully and not track it through the open part of your house. They'd have a little corridor that goes outside you, you treat it like it's toxic waste. And when they do it, it looks pretty crazy. But you want to do that because if you contaminate the rest of your house with these little mold spores, now you hear about these people that throwing away their couches and all their belongings, you know, depending on how bad the mold is, if you contaminate these other objects, especially couches, it's really, really hard to get those mold spores out of there because it's so porous. So to me, that begs the question also, if you're moving into a new place, before you move your couches in and have a problem and all of that, I mean, obviously inspections are done depending if you're buying or renting. What can we do in addition to that or what should we be doing or looking for? Moving in is a really good time to do a very, very thorough inspection and spend the money. I've had situations where we've gone in and we have found a lot of mold problems and we've actually brought that to the seller and they've agreed to pay for it. Mold is something that you can usually get them to pay because once we find out there's mold, now they have to disclose it and they'd rather just deal with it and get it fixed. And, um, one we had, we, we got $70,000 off the asking price and they almost didn't even call us up to come out. You know, And so a lot of times it's going to pay for itself because the last thing you want to do is sign an agreement, buy a house and move in and realize it's infested with mold. And now you're spending a bunch of money to get it fixed. You maybe you can't even live there for a while or even worse, you move into it and you start getting sick. Now the whole family's sick. Now you're spending years detoxing and getting the stuff out of your system. It's not that easy to get out. It's much easier to prevent than it is to get it out. So That's take the time point. to do the proper inspections before you move in. And to take it seriously. I think people yes. may not realize, I think mold is so tough because it's really hard to see unless it's pervasive. People just assume, I don't see black anywhere, so I don't have mold in my house. What would you say to somebody who would think like that? Well, unfortunately, people don't take it seriously until they get sick or they've been affected or they know someone personally that's been sick. Funny story, you know, 
12 years ago, 14 years ago, I was actually working at a mold remediation company as project manager. And I ended up getting sick for mold. I was one of, we were one of those companies that you wouldn't want to call. Not that we were being dishonest or shady. We just didn't know any better. We mm. weren't as careful as we should have been. We, you know, we'd, we'd cut out the mold and we'd build it back, but we weren't as careful with containment. We weren't as careful of cleaning up the area really good. And I got really sick from it. I also was happened to be living in a house with mold at the time. It knocked me out for like a year. They thought I had wow. stomach cancer. They wanted to take my gallbladder out. All the, the doctors, they couldn't figure out. And finally, I went to a specialist. He says, no, you've got heavy mold toxicity. I'm like, oh, that's funny because I'm a mold remediator and I <laughs> live in a moldy house. That's what really changed my course to like, holy cow, this is a big deal. This is not just a profession. This is helping people's lives. This is, this is something that really are getting people sick. But unfortunately, I had to go through that process. And I feel like a lot of people that are really understand mold have gone through that process as well. And so I think just listening to this and understanding it and taking the proactive steps of, hey, let's just get this checked. Let's just do a test. Let's figure out if this is something that is going to be a problem or not. And you can do an ERMI test. It's a dust swipe test. 250 bucks, 300 bucks. You swipe the dust from your house, you send it into the lab. They'll tell you if you have a, a mold problem or not. It, it doesn't tell you where the mold's at, but for a couple hundred bucks, it's like taking the temperature. It's like, are we sick or not? Yes, we are. Okay, now let's go to the next level and figure out where the mold's at. But that's a really good check that people can do. That's so like interesting that. because in my building, we asked them to test for mold recently and they tested it through airway, not through dust. Is dust more accurate? Because Air is going to be 80% false negative, and the people that own the building and run the building know that. And so the last thing that they want is a huge mold problem on their hand. So landlords, people that don't want to find mold, that's their go-to test every time. Mm, wow. Like with, wow. With an ERMI, you can't fake it. But with air samples, it's we only use air samples for cavity or for disturbed samples or for in a room that has large amount, we can see how much contamination is in the air. But that's really all we use it for. We don't use it to say, do you have a mold problem or not? We use the ERMI, the swabs, the dust analysis, and visualization. How do you spell ERMI if we wanted to look it up? E-R-M-I. So, so would you suggest for somebody who is, you know, they, like me right now, suspicious, do I have mold in my house? Should I start with the ERMI test? Would that be a first step? So ERMI... So there's the two parts of the mold, the mold that's growing, which in your wall, but that's not what's making you sick unless you're over there licking the wall. What's making you sick is the mold spores and the mycotoxins that are coming off of it. Think about like if there was a cig someone smoking a cigarette in that room for, let's say the leak was going on for three months. They've been in there smoking a cigarette for three months. How much of that cigarette smoke are you going to smell throughout the rest of the house? It's yeah. not just the, it's not just isolated to that one area. Because right. mold spores are a little bit bigger than, than smoke particles. We're talking microscopic, really small. And so it doesn't take long for it to proliferate and go through the rest of your house, get into your surfaces. So when we do the ERMI, what we're doing is saying, how much of these mold spores are settled out into the dust? Is it an mm -hmm. average amount of mold spores or is it higher than average because we have a source in the house? So that's what the ERMI tells us. The, what tells us the most about your situation is we have a visible leak. We know for sure that water's been leaking. We see the signs. So we're going to say 90% chance that there's mold growing back behind that wall just because it's been wet for so long. Correct. Okay? That makes sense. That's, that's really all we need to know. And so since that was wet in the wall cavity, that's justification to cut open the drywall, take the insulation out, clean everything really good, and then build it back. Yeah. Okay. And there are different brands of ERMI. Is that correct? There is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there's a dust test, and that's a really common one. We use the dust test. I like that one. That's usually the go-to. And soon we're going to have some on our website, and we're going to try to get a discount with them. I was just talking with them to try to get a discount for my clients. But there's another company, Envirobiomics, that we like to use. That's another good one. But yeah, if you just Google ERMI, then a bunch will show up. Cool. And so for Test My Home, are you guys a national company? Where are you guys based? So we were trying to grow nationally and go into the franchising, but it just didn't work out. It was too much logistics, too much headache, too many people trying to manage, and it wasn't getting fun anymore. So we kind of pulled that back and worked more into the remote thing. And it kind of worked well around COVID as well when everybody else was going remote. It was like, okay, well, this is our chance to maybe see if we can 
come up with a system to go remote. And so we developed a, you know, I looked at all the testing that I'd done is what's the most important thing? What are we seeing the most common? And I put together a package where we ship out this equipment. So it includes an urn, it includes a water test kit, it includes an air uh, meter, it includes, uh, you know, it includes an EMF meter, this one here. And so with when you get that in the mail, then I have these forms that you can go through your house and fill out all the data and the information and then a bunch of videos, how-to videos, step-by-step. Step. And so once you get all the data and all the information, then you get on a, a call. Part of the kit includes three calls, actually, with either me or, or one of our team. And the first one is to talk about how to test, go through the home and make sure we test it properly. The second one is to interpret the results. And then the third call is to go over all of the uh, options that we have and the solutions to get all the stuff fixed. So that's been pretty good, actually. And I will say, before you even had that kit, I met with Ryan, I think about two years ago, um, and we met for just an hour. And the information alone that you gave me changed the way I looked at everything in my home. And it was empowering because you can identify where problems may be, even without the testing, but you also gave me solutions, um, which is what we're about here is not to make people fearful of all the toxins that could be in their home, but really to say, okay, this might be there, but you have the power to do things about it. Um, yep. And I was really grateful to you and still am for the tools and the tricks and the things that you need to do to take control of your environment. Yeah. And you know, and that's important because it is focused on the end result and that's is getting better or feeling better or preventing yourself from getting sick. This, these things are the tools we need to uncover what could potentially be causing that. But yeah, the, we focus on solutions. That's the main focus. And, you know, like I said, because I've been doing this so long, I kind of know a lot. I see the same problems over and over again. So I know where to look. I know what questions to ask. And it's amazing how much even just an hour Zoom walkthrough like we did with you can have such an impact. Huge. I think it's so important for everyone, you know, hopefully thank God for your work and, you know, building the awareness for people that just start at the home level and just make sure that your home is, you know, before you move in, that's a great place. But if you're already there, just have it checked on just so you can rule out and just know that you've like dotted your I's and crossed your T's and then you can kind of move on and hopefully you just continue to feel good. Like you don't, I think we have a hard time thinking about coming at things from a preventative standpoint. And so this is such a great tool to empower people to just know that the home that they're spending most of their time in, in their lives, is a sound and a good quality environment. And sometimes you may not feel like doing it for yourself, but do it for your loved one, your partner, your kids, your family, even your dog, your pet, <laughs> whoever it is that might inspire you to go and do that. I think it's such a great starting point and that you make it so accessible for people to be able to do that. I think that that's wonderful. Uh, just to close out this interview, uh, what is one drop of wisdom that you would like to leave our listeners with today based upon your experience? Um, <clears throat> I think that um, showing gratitude and thankfulness and having a positive mindset and a positive spirit trumps all things when it comes to health and wellness. I think that's so important to do, especially with environmental work, especially not being stressed about this stuff and just... Um, and just being positive and being happy and whatever you got to do to get that. You know, I always say clean water, clean food, clean air, and clean thoughts. If you can do those four things, you're like 95% of the way there. Yeah, that's great. I like that. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This is, um, and for me, knowing that just testing the air for mold is not enough is... <laughs> <laughs> is life is, is changing and and um I, you know i highly encourage anyone to, you know who's interested in learning more to, to to go to test my home it really changed the way that i look at my home and i'm so grateful to ryan and his team thank you so much for being here today yeah thanks for having me on help spread the word i appreciate it 